Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Rox Berkey on today's show. Welcome to Indie Beacon Show. I'm Rox Berkey, your host for this evening, and I am delighted to have with me not only a renowned vintner in Texas, but an author, Paul. Oh, I'm going to mess it up again. Bonarigo. Bonarigo. Uh, you know, I mean, we've been buddies for a while, but I never can get your last name right. I'm so sorry. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. So, you know, I really want to talk about how a first generation Italian guy from the Bronx marries a daughter of the American Revolution, fifth generation in Texas, and yet becomes a pioneer in the Texas wine industry. What's up with that? Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, when you look at life's pathways, uh, you would never guess that that would happen. Um, you know, I grew up in the Bronx where I saw my first tree when I was 12. <laughs> and uh, here I am at 74 and I'm a farmer. Uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it, it's a, it's a, it was an amazing path. I, I went from uh, New York uh, to the United States Navy to uh, Bryan College Station. I was the only physical therapist in this community. And uh, Merrill was a real estate agent and uh, she wanted to sell my house. It was a contemporary. Uh-huh. And if it was not for my um, uh, boxer, uh, she would have sold the house and we would have never uh, married but the dog was terrible. And so she couldn't sell the house. And later we uh, dated and married. I think that's just a wonderful, charming love story. But you know, what's really interesting to me, Paul, is that you have really been involved in the wine industry for a long time and specifically in Texas. And, And by, you know, by European standards, Texas is kind of an immature wine industry, but by United States standards, it's a rocker. Yeah, well, you know, the, the the wine industry in the United States really took off, uh, I would say, in the 60s. When I went to uh, UC Davis in the 60s, uh, there were three wineries uh, in Napa Valley uh, back then. And uh, I had the opportunity of working at BV, Beaulieu Vineyard. And then when, we, when I came to Texas, uh, everyone said you couldn't grow grapes in Texas, which made absolutely no, no, no sense whatsoever, because our climate... Uh, we derive all of our weather from uh, Washington State uh, because of the jet stream. Right. So we grow grapes just like Washington State does. And, uh, and so the, we went from last in the nation in production to fifth in the nation in production uh, in 30 years. So uh, the potential for Texas is enormous. Oh, my gosh. It's a remarkable transformation over that time. And so many more people are getting involved in the wine industry here in Texas. I mean, how many vintners are there right now in Texas? I mean, it's a, a hundreds. Yes, like 650. When we started, there were three. And uh, now we've got 650. And, and it's amazing. Every, every month, we get a couple more wineries opening up. And now we're getting vineyards planted. So, you know, the state is so big. Uh, right. You know, there's a place that you can grow grapes uh, all over Texas. So uh, it, it's amazing. It's just a, an exciting story. It really is an exciting story, which actually brings me to your book, which is Family, Tradition, and Romance, the Messina Hoff story. I mean, that's a remarkable story because you're in your second generation now or third? Well, uh, as far as ownership of the yeah. winery, we're in our second generation. Okay. Uh, Merrill and I had it for 38 years, and now my son's had it for the last uh, five years. And, uh, and so he is the winemaker. His wife is the uh, administrative director. And um, I was president of the Texas wine industry three times. He's been the uh, president of the Texas wine industry now once. And uh, so the legacy moves on. And uh, I'm so proud of him because he's a Naval Academy graduate. He's a Marine went to uh, Iraq and decided it was a little safer to be in the wine business than to be shot at. 
Yeah, good call on that part. And thank you for your service and your sons as well. That's just remarkable. And we're so delighted that you uh, brought all that expertise here. So, you know, you and Meryl have been doing this for a long time. And I, as I understand it from previous conversations with you, I mean, she really has been doing the administrative stuff and kind of making sure people do it. And you have how many locations right now? Uh, we have four, four wineries. We have one in Grapevine, uh, one in Fredericksburg, uh, the mother house here in Bryan College Station. And then we have a brand new winery in Richmond, Texas. Uh, and it's a, a farm to table uh, operation down there. And uh, it's called Harvest Green. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful location and uh, a beautiful restaurant. And we derive almost all of our produce from the gardens of uh, the uh, development. You know, I think that's just remarkable. I think people across the country forget how big the farming industry overall is here in Texas. I know a few weeks ago I went through and saw all the beautiful corn fields and pop, um, sunflower seed fields. And it's just remarkable to me. But the, but the vineyards are also remarkable. So, you know, the hill country, Fredericksburg, that whole area has always been kind of primary as far as the thought process goes um, in, in Texas wines. But that's not the only place we do vines. I mean, we have them in North Texas. I know we have them up here in Allen. I have several friends that have actually invested. Um, they don't make wine, but they do produce some great grapes mm -hmm. for, yeah. for us to, to leverage. So is there a limit to the kind of grapes that we can um, produce here in Texas? Uh, not really. I mean, I haven't seen the limitation. Uh, uh, there are certain grapes that do better in certain locations, just as it is uh, true in Europe. Uh, so we're, we're learning what grapes do best where and, uh, and the, uh, about 75 to 78% of all the grapes are actually grown in the high plains um, okay. around Lubbock. So we're looking at the area about anywhere from five to 60 miles uh, radius around Lubbock. And, uh, we have, it, it, it's a unique environment because it's a elevated uh, plateau and the, uh, the elevation is 36 to 3,800 feet. Wow. And so we do get uh, warm days, uh, sometimes hot days and uh, cool nights. And so uh, it's really a great place, alluvial soil uh, wow. with an underpinning of, of limestone, uh, it's amazing. And, and then now the hill country is coming on uh, with more grape growing. And as you said, North Texas actually has almost as many wineries as the hill country. So yeah. it's, uh, it's really exciting to see. Well, it's remarkable. And, you know, we always forget that Texas A&M is a big agricultural college and community. And I know you're very involved with that. And I want to get into that in a little bit. Um, but before we do that, why did you decide that you wanted to write this book at this time? Well, you know, through the years, we've had so many people visit us and say, oh, I want to start a winery. Uh, what do you recommend? Well, uh, we decided to write the book talking about how this all started, uh, how I began as a child in the Bronx, uh, how Merrill growing up in, uh, in Bryan and then how we got together and we learned a lot of things along the way. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. We made a lot of uh, uh, very joyful experiences. And so the book is funny. It's inspirational. Uh, it, it teaches uh, what to do and what not to do. So it's a great book if somebody is thinking of getting into the wine business because uh, it's not just sipping wine on the back porch. Uh, there's a lot of work involved in it. So, uh, and you better have uh, enough finances to do it. Otherwise, um, you're going to find that uh, the wine business is a big black hole. You know, we say, you know, there's two things, uh, a sailboat and a winery, you know, and the way you uh, enjoy both is to start with a large fortune <laughs> and, uh, and go from there. Okay, so we're at a point, I, this goes so quickly, Paul, but we're at a point where we're going to take a pause, we're going to listen to our sponsors, I'm going to come back and really talk about how you put this book together, so stick around. 
Hello, I am the author Denise Bryson. My first book is The Things That Cross My Mind, Inspirational Poetry with Life Lessons. And then my audio book is Love's Reality. And it is also inspirational poetry with a jazzy flair. And then my new book is The Sex, The Lies, and The Soul Ties. They're really short stories uh, written from a poetic uh, expression. And then I have my first children book series, the Blinky series, which the first book is called Meet the Coins, and it is both in English and Spanish. And then the new book uh, from Coins the bills. I am the author, Denise Bryson. Marianne Fairmouth is a career consultant with 30 years experience in the national recruiting world, a multi-award winning author in multi-genres, and a speaker that gives presentations to help you succeed. Her book, Revolutionary Recruiting, made the top 20 global list of recruiting books. Find her on Amazon, your favorite bookstore, or at Fairmouth.com. to embrace your children's imagination, check out Diane Floyd Bain's books for kids. There's The Moonling Adventures, all about the animals in the Serengeti. And then there's Harry the Camel, learning to love yourself just the way you are. Then The Little Girl in the Moon. There's one about friendship, another one about the big ideas, which is an inspirational story. And then Tour Tycho Town, right there in Tycho Crater on the Moon. All of Diane Floyd Bain's books are available at B4R Store. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Rox Berkey on today's show. Welcome back to the Indie Beacon Show, and I'm here back with Paul Bonaringo. I'm so happy to see you again and, and continue this discussion. You're a very, you know, a, a vital force in the Texas wine industry. And writing this book and starting to share not only the ins and outs, but the humor. So, you know, what was some of the funniest things that you've included in the book? I want to kind of titillate this group, you know? Well, it, and this has to do with finances as well. Uh, uh, my major was physical therapy. So uh, Merrill's um, major was in accounting. So when we uh, decided to expand, uh, Merrill uh, made a beautiful presentation and went to the bank and, and I had a very good relationship with the bank. And she made this beautiful presentation. And at the conclusion, uh, the banker said, you know, Paul, I think you should self-finance. And so we left the meeting and I stepped outside, congratulated Merrill and I said, what type of a loan was self-finance and she said that means meant he turned us down and uh, there was no loan <laughs> and, oh, no. and i and to this day i tell the the banker who's a dear friend uh, that was the best thing that he's ever done because it uh made us think twice about going into debt and uh, my mother you know her philosophy about finances were was that if you didn't have the money in your pocket you couldn't afford it yeah. And so it was uh, good advice. And uh, that, that was a learned lesson early on, you know, in our existence. I, you know, I think that's a really valuable lesson. I think it's one we should teach to all of our young people now because they're kind of out there on the string, you know, in many, many ways. So now you've, you've kind of turned over the, the reins of the operation to your son, but I know he's a part of the book because he's family. So, so did he help you with the book or was he part of your inspiration for your book? Well, the, the chapter that deals with his life, uh, uh, especially at the Naval Academy and, uh, and his marriage, um, he was uh, an integral part of, uh, of writing and proofing and making sure that it was the way he wanted it to be said. Uh, but the rest of the book, Marilyn and I wrote and, uh, and we decided to uh, talk about transition because we're at the point in our history now in Texas where we've got a lot of early um, pioneers who are getting ready to retire. And, you know, they always say, oh, I'm going to have my son or daughter take over. Right. And many times uh, that is not the plan for the uh, for the son or daughter. Uh, you know, when you start noticing that they're they're moving away from Texas, then you know that they're not interested in getting involved in this industry. 
Well, and it's the same thing with a lot of the farmers that we have too. Some of these really large spreads they hope to share with their children. You know, the kids just don't, they're not into it at all. And so I'm, I'm, I was delighted to know that your son is into that. And he has two children as well, right? So you have two grandchildren. Yeah, and, and his daughter, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was last year, they had a career day at her school. Um, you know, she's in the fourth grade. And, uh, and she wrote down that she was taking over the winery. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I warned my son that it could be a lot sooner than he thinks. Uh, <laughs> So she's got big plans and, uh, and, and she works, uh, like this summer, she works at the winery in the mornings. Okay. And, uh, a lot of times Merrill and I have the kids in the afternoon and we'll work with them in the vineyard in the afternoon. So just like my son, uh, you know, we got started with him when he was very young right. and he, he has essentially done everything in the winery. He, he's worked in the restaurant, he's worked in production. And, and now his daughter and his, uh, his son is, are doing the same thing, which I think is essential. So do they do the grape salt too? I mean, oh, I have to yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's the fun part of the whole thing. And, the, and they love jumping in there. I mean, uh, they've got a t-shirt. I think the first time Sophia jumped in, I think she was three months. Oh my gosh. And, uh, oh, and, she, and, and you know, I, it was really exciting because when she jumped in, yeah. her feet uh, immediately started going up and down. So I told my son, it's genetically predetermined. <laughs> now you have your own vineyards yourself and you grow about how many, how many acres of, of vines do you have? Well, on the estate, we have about 21, 22 acres. And uh, I have a beautiful vineyard right in my front yard. Uh, and it's a, a wine that I'm very excited about. It's called Sagrantino. Um, and it comes from Umbria, and uh, we have won international gold medals. I mean, it is a fabulous grape for, for Texas. You know, and that's the other really marvelous thing in the wine industry um, around the world. It's all about the medals and the recognition and the blind taste tests that people go through to recognize the wine, and time and time again, Texas is faring very, very well in those. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, last year at the San Francisco Chronicle wine competition, yeah. uh, Texas won the second most number of best of classes, even though we were the fifth in the number of entries. So that's amazing that we could be second only to California. And yet, you know, we were, you know, fifth in 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 the number of entries. So uh, Texas really shows well, uh, and it's really important that we continue to do that. Because, you know, when I started way back in the 60s, yeah. um, I, I went to the Fairmont Hotel, and I asked for the BV Cabernet Sauvignon, and the st wine steward said to me, we serve no California wine here at the Fairmont because they're not any good. So people don't remember that yeah. California wine was once considered not very good uh and now look what look what we see i mean california makes great wine so so what kind of grapes seem to thrive the most i mean i've heard of tempanillo how do we do with like chardonnay grapes and and those kinds of the white grapes are we are we still strong in that area as well or not i, I think we're a little stronger in reds than we are in whites, but uh, Viognier, we just won a, a best of class at, at uh, San Francisco for Viognier. Uh, Viognier does extremely well. Tempranillo does extremely well, which is red, uh, right. but we're, we're getting such diversity. That, that's the beauty of being in a non-traditional wine industry. You know, we're not uh, legally bound to grow certain grapes. Right. So Texans are very independent minded. So they're growing every kind of European uh, grape that you can imagine. And uh, it's exciting to see it. I mean, uh, we grow 36 different varieties, make 98 wines. Holy moly. That's, and that's, that's Messina Hoff. And so if you look at the whole industry in the state, I bet you that Tex Texas wineries are making wine from at least 50, maybe 60 varietals. And they, and they get those from other vintner or other growers. Um, 
you have a lot of people in Texas that are growing grapes, but they aren't making wine. So they they just like the growing too, right? Absolutely. And there's both types. You have vineyard operators, there's winery operators. And then like us, we do both. We, we right. grow grapes as well as make wine. So this book that you guys put together, again, this is a really fascinating book because of the family and the tradition. And it's not only the family tradition, it's the wine tradition. Romance, because you and Meryl are like, y'all are still just romantic as can be. Um, and the whole Messina Hoff story. Um, how long did it take you to put the book together? Oh, we worked on it uh, the whole year. Uh, it took us 12 months to put, you know, we had you know, a lot of stories that, because uh, at many of our wine dinners, I like to tell stories about the things that have happened to us. Yeah. And we put those stories down in the book, but it took us 12 months to do it. And, uh, um, you know, it was so much fun doing it because, uh, you know, as we would write a story down, we would laugh because some of these things are hilarious. You know, one of the funniest things that happened uh, way back in the 80s, I decided we were going to show the people in West Texas how to make wine. So I loaded all my equipment up on a flatbed truck and drove it out to uh, Pete Laney's house. He was the speaker of the house. Uh, and so I worked from seven in the morning until the next day, processed um, uh, 1,400 gallons worth of white Zinfandel at the time. And then I, it, I loaded the uh, truck back up and started driving back to Bryan. It was essentially a floating winery going through every dry county in the <laughs> state of Texas. And I was never stopped by a police officer. Uh, we, we made the wine in less than a month. We submitted it to New York at the Eastern International Wine Competition, and we won the best of show and, wow. and the best in the nation. And when they asked me to go to New York and tell the story of how I made it, I told them, and they never believed it. There was no <laughs> way they were going to believe the story. No, it's a Texas tall tale. So we're, we're at a first point to take a break. Um, I, you know, I want to, I want to come back again, but we have to take a short break for our sponsors. So stick around, Paul. Publishing marketing package for authors. $1,500 value, save 40% now. Includes a six-piece marketing kit of 250 bookmarks, 250 business cards, 250 postcards, one table banner, one table runner, and 50 download cards. Plus, book cover design, ebook creation, PDF setups, upload to Ingram Spark, squirrel placement, video commercial, and interview on IBS. Plus much more. Email bourgeois media at look.com for details or bourgeoismedia.com. Hi, I'm Mel Greenberg, author of Running With Our Eyes Closed, book one in the Empty Nested series. To the world, Samantha has the perfect life. Three wonderful children, a loving husband, so she thought, and a life split between Dallas and Italy. When her youngest leaves for college, it all comes crashing down, forcing Samantha to re-examine everything. Over seven days in one of the most romantic countries in the world, Samantha faces the past she thought she'd overcome and begins to redefine her role as a woman, a wife, and a mother. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? Well, during COVID, almost all of us have been doing just that. I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author, actress, and speaker. And my book, you have to laugh to keep from crying, shows you how you can revive, thrive, and survive with four golden rules. You have to love one another. You have to respect one another. You have to have patience with one another. And most of all, you've got to forgive one another. I'm Charlotte Canyon, and I approve this message. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Rox Berkey on today's show. Welcome back to the Indie Beacon Show, and I'm here with Paul Bonarigo, and I am so happy to have you here, Paul, and I wish we had like five more hours to talk, but we don't because I want to hear more stories, but we will do that. One of the things I would love to do, Paul, is tell people where you're going to be because you have wine events that you go to, you have your locations. Where can people find you, shake your hand, and hear one of your stories? 
Well, Meryl and I are here at the winery uh, most of the time uh, because we work in the vineyard. You know, we've, we've gone from uh, founder, uh, winery owner, and now we're vineyard workers. It's really a fabulous way to go. Uh, but, but we're going to be taking a, a group to Bordeaux on the uh, 5th of August. Uh, we do a lot of river cruises where we are the host and we go on the AMA waterways cruises and we take them to, uh, to fabulous places. And Bordeaux is a great place. We've been there quite a few times and uh, this will be our second river cruise that we'll be taking our VIP. So we'll be doing that, but we'll also be doing Grape Fest, which is up in Grapevine in September. Yep. And um, it's the largest wine festival in the United States. It's right here in the great state of Texas. It's amazing. And then harvest uh, is the whole month of August. So we'll be very, very busy picking grapes. As a matter of fact, we're gonna probably start picking some white grapes on Thursday of this coming week. And uh, so we stay pretty close to home. And then uh, as we wind down harvest, we take off because we're gonna, we're gonna be doing a lot of European trips the next uh, 24 months. So how's, how's COVID reacting with some of these European trips? Has that like been an impediment or are you booking up fast and things are cool or? Well, now, yeah, now there's a lot of enthusiasm. You know, it's been very, very uh, limited uh, to zero, basically. We had uh, two cruises last year that were pushed back. Uh, we're gonna be going to Porto in Portugal uh, a year from uh, October. Okay. because it was supposed to be last year and it got pushed back. The other thing that we're going to do is I'm bringing a group of our VIPs to my homeland in Sicily, where my family still makes wine. And, uh, and so we're going to be bringing a wonderful group and we're going to uh, tour Sicily, okay. which is, uh, you know, if, if you have never been to Sicily, the people are so warm and charming. It's, it's a great place. So if you want to become a VIP, with you guys how does somebody do that well it's very simple you just uh go to our website and uh and on the website it'll ask about our two programs one is a vip program and the second is a wine ship program okay. and then while you're on the site uh, you could hit the button that uh that uh, has uh, an opportunity to buy the book and then that'll get you even more excited about it Oh, no kidding. And the book is amazing because you guys sign it, right? Oh, so yeah. We, we signed it. You're, you're getting a signed book from the author, from the creator, from the vintner in Texas. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it couldn't be any better. So what's that website name real quick? It's uh, www.mistinahop.com uh, uh, backslash about dash us. And uh, you can uh, go to that location and, uh, and buy the book. And you can buy the book. You can sign up for an email. You can be part of your newsletter. Yes. Yes. If, and, and we're very active VIP, in that, that way. If, if you're a VIP person, do you get to come and, you know, help harvest the grapes and stomp on them too? Absolutely. Uh, beginning the uh, first weekend in August, people will, uh, last year we had, oh, over 2,000, in spite of COVID, <laughs> came and picked and stomped and uh, they got their t-shirt, their little feet on the shirt. Uh, and then we enjoy food and wine experiences and, uh, and great wine. I mean, uh, so uh, it's a memorable way of enjoying the Texas wine industry is to come to Messina Hoff. We believe very strongly that, uh, that hospitality is, is essential uh, to grow this business. It's a big family that you have, not just your little family. So what's the address of the winery that you guys are at in case somebody wants to sneak over there in August? Oh, it's 4545 Old Reliance Road, and it's Bryan, Texas. Pa, I just, I, I want to come and see you and visit you. I certainly am going to go to your location in Grapevine because it's a little bit closer to me. I think you and Meryl are amazing, and your book is just it's delightful. The cover is phenomenal. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks, Rox. It was great being with you. 
Thank you for watching or listening to the Indie Beacon Show, produced by Diana Bourgeois for the Authors Marketing International LLC, copyright 2021. It's over by Diana Bourgeois. If you would like to be a sponsor of the show, please email us at authorsmarketing at outlook.com. If you would like to be on the show, please complete the form found on our website at indiebeacon.com. You may also watch previous year's shows on the website. Music is Solid of Words, created for Indie Beacon, 